a plant so resilient that farmers spend millions trying to kill it. Yet its biological mechanisms are far superior to the crops we protect. We call it the worst weed in the West. Convolvulus arvensis has been declared a noxious invader across 46 states. Agricultural departments issue bounties for its eradication. Yet for thousands of years, this species dominated the landscape from the Mediterranean to Central Asia without human permission. The bindweed root system can penetrate 30 feet into the soil, accessing water and minerals no annual crop can reach. Each fragment of root can regenerate into a new plant. Modern agriculture views this as biological warfare. History reveals a different truth. This wasn't a weed that escaped cultivation. This was a wild survivor that refused to die when we tried to tame the land. The white trumpet flowers bloom from May through October, signaling underground networks forming in the darkness. Those networks persist through drought years when wheat and barley fail. Today, we poison the soil trying to eliminate the plant that outsmarts our best engineering. Field bindweed belongs to the Convolvulaceae family, making it a wild relative of the sweet potato. The resemblance isn't superficial. Both species store energy in underground tubers. Both develop twining vines that conserve resources by using other plants for structural support. Both thrive in marginal soils where commercial crops struggle. The distinction isn't just botanical. The distinction is ideological. Sweet potato was domesticated in Central America 7,000 years ago because it submitted to human control. Field bindweed refused domestication because its roots grow irregularly, following underground water sources. The industrial system demanded predictability. Bindweed offered only autonomy. Commercial agriculture requires plants that grow in rows, harvest mechanically, and possess weak chemical defenses. This perennial produces scattered tubers at various depths, making mechanized interaction impossible. The plant was reclassified from flora to enemy the moment tractors replaced human observation. During the Roman expansion into Germania, legions watched this plant survive harsh winters by retreating into frozen ground. Medieval texts from monasteries across Europe document the persistence of bindweed when cultivated crops died. Turkish ecological records note how the roots stabilize soil in autumn, preparing the land for winter. Russian peasants knew the plant as povilik and recognized it as a marker of deep soil fertility. The roots developed complex chemical defenses to survive predation, unlike helpless domestic crops. Nutritional analysis shows bindweed tubers contain dense energy reserves designed for long-term survival. For comparison, modern russet potatoes are bred to be mostly water and simple starch. The difference is purpose. Yet one plant fills grocery shelves while the other is sprayed with glyphosate. Historical accounts describe the plant as having a resilience that borders on immortality. The structure of its root system resembles a fortress more than a vegetable. This wasn't designed for human consumption. This was legitimate biology that required no cultivation, no irrigation, and no human labor to thrive. The modern agricultural system spends over $100 million annually attempting to eradicate field bindweed from North American farmland. Herbicide applications kill the visible vines. The root system simply regenerates. Tilling fragments the roots into thousands of pieces. Each fragment becomes a new plant. The species has evolved to treat disturbance as a propagation strategy. Farming inadvertently multiplies the very plant it aims to destroy. Agricultural extension offices classify bindweed as a Class A noxious weed, requiring mandatory control by law in many jurisdictions. The crime isn't that the plant damages crops. The crime is that it cannot be controlled by the methods industrial farming depends upon. Bindweed exposes a fundamental flaw in monoculture logic. The system cannot tolerate plants that refuse to disappear on demand. Meanwhile, the underground tubers continue forming each season, invisible and untouchable, storing energy that no human can steal. Modern sweet potato varieties have been bred for high yield and lack of defense mechanisms. Commercial cultivars average 77% water content. 
Field bindweed tubers contain approximately 65% water when fresh. The higher dry matter content means more structural density per gram. Laboratory analysis reveals bindweed roots possess a complex chemistry that deters herbivores and pests. The chemical profile closely resembles that of a pharmaceutical plant full of active compounds. Scientific tests confirm that the plant invests heavily in its own survival rather than edible sugars. This aligns with evolutionary logic. Pre-industrial ecosystems favored plants that could defend themselves chemically. Vulnerability was rare. The contemporary preference for defenseless vegetables reflects a system that protects crops artificially, not inherent botanical superiority. We have bred crops to be weak and classified their wild relatives as noxious simply because they kept their armor. Agricultural publications warn that field bindweed contains alkaloids and is biologically potent. The same defensive compounds appear in many wild medicinal plants, though dosage makes the poison. Historical records show that humans once understood how to respect these potent plants, unlike today. The key lies in lost knowledge. Traditional interaction involved caution and specific understanding of plant chemistry. Modern toxicology studies focus on the presence of compounds that disrupt standardized food safety models. The distinction matters. Field bindweed represents a category of plants that refuse to be simple, safe commodities. However, current food safety regulations classify any plant with complex chemistry as a liability. The legal framework assumes that anything growing must be safe for instant consumption or destroyed. No corporation will study the ecological benefits of a plant that cannot be patented, controlled, or sold. The result is institutional hostility masquerading as management. We know more about the toxicity of synthetic pesticides than about the complex biology of the weeds we spray them on. What makes bindweed truly remarkable isn't the tubers themselves, but the root architecture that produces them. The plant develops a primary taproot that can descend 25 feet into subsoil layers. From this central anchor, lateral roots spread horizontally up to 30 feet in all directions. The network functions as an underground mining operation, extracting nutrients and moisture from soil volumes no annual crop can access. This is why bindweed thrives in degraded agricultural land. The plant specializes in reclaiming what intensive farming has depleted. The tubers form along these lateral roots as energy storage nodes, typically concentrated in the top 18 inches of soil. Each growing season produces new tubers while old ones persist. A mature bindweed network can contain dozens of energy nodes scattered across a wide area. Understanding them requires patience and observation rather than mechanized efficiency. This is precisely why the plant has no place in industrial food systems. It demands relationship, not extraction. It rewards knowledge of place, not standardized procedure. Despite its reputation as an ineradicable pest, field bindweed is surprisingly difficult to establish intentionally. The seeds require specific temperature fluctuations and soil disturbance to germinate. Most failed establishment attempts involve planting in rich garden soil with regular watering. The plant evolved for marginal conditions. It interprets fertility and moisture as signals that competition will be intense, triggering dormancy instead of growth. Successful propagation requires root cuttings, not seeds. A three-inch section of lateral root placed in compacted dry soil will often generate new growth where seeds would fail. The species thrives on neglect. Commercial agriculture accidentally creates ideal bindweed habitat through its own practices. Tilling that fragments roots, irrigation systems that provide just enough moisture to sustain deep tap roots, and herbicides that eliminate competing annual weeds. The industrial food system is simultaneously trying to destroy bindweed while creating the exact conditions that ensure its persistence. This isn't incompetence. This is the inevitable consequence of treating soil as a sterile medium rather than a living ecosystem. Comparative evaluations between field bindweed and domestic crops reveal an uncomfortable truth. 
Bindweed roots harvested after the first frost contain concentrated chemical energy, a mechanism for surviving deep freezes. When analyzed, the tubers show a density of compounds that modern crops have lost through breeding. The profile combines structural carbohydrates with potent alkaloids that serve as biological shields. There is no weakness in this design. Traditional knowledge likely viewed such plants as powerful agents rather than casual food sources. Contemporary botany reports the plant as a master of chemical warfare against its environment. The tubers absorb minerals readily, making them indicators of soil composition. Historical patterns suggest bindweed was respected for its tenacity, serving as a reminder of nature's power. The fact that this biological complexity exists nowhere in the modern crop field represents a simplification of nature. We have sacrificed biological strength for agricultural convenience. American farmers collectively spend more money attempting to control field bindweed than the crop would be worth if harvested intentionally. A single herbicide application costs approximately $40 per acre. Effective bindweed suppression requires three to five applications over multiple years. The total investment exceeds $200 per acre with no guaranteed success. Meanwhile, the underground biomass on a heavily infested acre represents tons of carbon stored in the soil. No one values it. The economic logic appears inverted until you consider the real issue. Bindweed cannot be integrated into mechanized farming systems. The plant's value is irrelevant if it cannot be harvested, processed, and distributed using existing infrastructure. Industrial agriculture has created food networks so specialized that crops must conform to machinery specifications or be classified as weeds regardless of ecological merit. The distinction between valuable and noxious has become purely operational, not botanical. This represents a profound narrowing of what qualifies as success in the modern imagination. We have confused compatibility with industrial processing for inherent biological value. Field bindweed is a true perennial, returning from the same root system for decades without replanting. This trait alone makes it superior to annual crops in terms of soil conservation, carbon sequestration, and resource efficiency. Perennial root systems build soil structure rather than depleting it. They create habitat for mycorrhizal fungi networks that improve nutrient cycling across entire ecosystems. The deep tap roots prevent erosion and break up hardpan layers that limit water infiltration. Annual agriculture demands complete soil disturbance every growing season, releasing stored carbon and destroying soil biology. Perennial natural systems require none of that. Bindweed represents an undomesticated model for what perennial crops could achieve. Minimal input, maximum resilience, and reliable growth across varying climate conditions. Modern agricultural research has invested billions attempting to breed perennial versions of wheat and rice. The model already exists, growing wild and unwanted across millions of acres. We spray poison on the prototype while funding research to recreate it. The irony is almost too perfect. Observing field bindweed in the contemporary context isn't gardening. It is an explicit rejection of the command and control mindset. It is a statement that biology exists outside approved supply chains. The plant requires no purchased inputs, no irrigation infrastructure, and no pest management. It needs only time and willingness to coexist with a species on its own terms. The growth happens in autumn, after the vines die back, when the root energy is concentrated in the tubers. Understanding follows the lateral roots outward from the main stem, mapping the network without removing the entire system. This observation allows us to see how the plant regenerates. The practice resembles ecological study more than conventional vegetable gardening. It requires accepting that the plant sets its own schedule and distribution pattern. Control is relinquished in exchange for understanding. This relationship feels alien to those raised on garden catalogs and standardized spacing. But it represents how humans interacted with nature for most of history. In negotiation with plants, not domination of them. Field bindweed will outlast the agricultural system currently fighting it. The species has survived glaciation cycles, volcanic eruptions, 
and millennia of human land use. It will certainly survive herbicide applications and climate change. The question isn't whether bindweed persists. The question is whether humans remember how to respect it before nature forces a reckoning. Every abandoned field contains a biological reserve that no one acknowledges. The underground tubers form regardless of human recognition. They wait in the soil, storing energy from sunlight, converting carbon dioxide into biomass, performing the ancient miracle of photosynthesis that makes all life possible. We have built elaborate systems to replicate this process in controlled environments with hybrid seeds and chemical fertilizers. Meanwhile, the wild version continues freely, asking nothing, offering resilience. The choice to ignore this abundance is ideological, not practical. Reconnecting with bindweed story means reconnecting with a nature that existed before grocery stores, before monoculture, before the idea that plants exist to serve human convenience rather than their own survival. The bindweed growing along your fence line represents a doorway to biological sovereignty that corporations cannot close. No patent controls its reproduction. No supply chain can interrupt its growth. No store can refuse to stock it. The plant persists as a living archive of pre-industrial biological resilience waiting for humans to notice. Learning to recognize and respect bindweed roots is a small act with radical implications. It demonstrates that nature doesn't require permission from the agro-industry. It proves that life can exist outside market systems. Every ecosystem that survived periodic upheaval maintained distinct species that required no cultivation. We have exchanged that complexity for barcode scanners and produce managers. The trade seemed reasonable during decades of cheap fossil fuels and stable climate. The fragility of that arrangement becomes more visible each season. Bindweed roots offer no complete solution to food system vulnerability, but they represent one thread in the broader tapestry of alternatives that industrial agriculture has nearly erased from memory. The first step is simply acknowledging that the plant currently labeled as pest is actually a master of survival.